yogurt. Yeah. Um, not all of the links are active um, after they're posted, but a good number are. Yeah. Good number. Like the and, and yeah, I was able to find. So this is the other thing. Uh, what one thing that maybe goes a little bit less reported, but maybe it's not as unreported as one might think, is that a lot of local governments, especially state level and city level governments, are acquiring lots of data from. What I would think is completely illegal wiretap, you know, cameras and this and that, it's just an obnoxious ways of observing us. Nevertheless, they have data and they want to do something with it. In fact, someone I know runs a startup that does exactly this with traffic data. They're sort of instrumenting the traffic thing, trying to figure out how people go about their way, especially get commute time and try to regulate traffic. So I know, uh, for example, the city of Chicago mm -hmm. has been working with uh, a friend of mine at Stanford to sort of uh, build better budgeting processes and sort of collect a lot of data on, on different parts of the budget process and how to crowdsource some of these things. So I think local government activities, both Chicago and New York and Seattle to some extent, Seattle is the one you have, have been very uh, ahead of the game in terms of finding uh, data and trying to play with it. And because it's public, at some level, at some point, they do have to release this data in some anonymized form. So that might be one other place to go look if you haven't already looked at that. And data.gov, I guess, is a good place to start. So we have two algorithms now that should give you something. So definitely try those things out, and maybe there will come more algorithms coming up. So, and I guess you, you had sort of you knew about this data ahead of time. Yeah, that uh, actually there is one more we have to just verify whether it can be used for. Okay. Uh, uh, this, this is not. Uh, this is not actually yeah, a labor. Yeah. So this is just a purchased data, data set. Like, uh -huh. uh, so Dominic's is out of business, but they before they died, they gave away all their data, which is like lots and lots of data about. Mm -hmm. Uh, loyalty program, so people right. come and purchase. And they have categories of food items, food items purchase as what, right? So you can imagine, yeah. and that's the thing, right? It, it, that data set might look unlabeled, but it has actual domain specific information in, from which you can construct labels. Now let's get to your point, yes, right? That's so you said, said, take an unlabeled data set and take the first coordinate. I mean, I mean any coordinate, any, any dimension any, coordinate, is any attribute. Yes, any dimension is a label. So give me an example. So yeah, here's a good example. Awesome. He found some. Yes. NYC open data. So I, 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 don't think I, can I found. I know you're not gonna be able to see it. So I found. Uh, I found NYC open data. Ah, yes. it, it has a lot of a lot of stuff actually. Okay. Um, this is accident data. The accident took place in one dimension, and it's got you know latitudes, longitudes, um, streets, and stuff like that. I okay. think that would be. So I would. So I'm gonna pick the latitude as a label. What does this tell me? Mm, you cannot. You cannot pick that. I can't. Why not? I mean, you just said I can pick any attribute. All the values will be different. Then. Sorry? Category category. No, all, all the values will be different. I mean, most of the values will be different. So you're saying pick a category of latitude. But what if you did latitude? So what, give me one. Location. You could do yes, uh, the, the location, borough, the, the borough. The borough. The, the yeah. borough, which is like Manhattan or Brooklyn. Yes. OK. And there's, I think there's five. So then, OK, so if you're saying the label is the borough, then you're saying, given all the remaining attributes, I want to predict, predict where the crime happened? Is that what you're trying to say with your costume as well? I want to say so what would you be, what where, where, where the majority of them happened? Or Pardon me? Maybe you want to say like where most of the accidents are happening? But if that's most, you mean, I mean, is there a real costume problem there? So that's the thing. I mean, it may be possible to take an attribute and say this is the label. Mm -hmm. But are you going to generate a costume problem? A meaningful one, as opposed to just something that just, you know, yeah. I was gonna say it sounds like it's two way, right? I mean, you could generate a cluster, or you could you could try to guess like the um, the type of crime or the type of accident based on the geographic data. So then or you're picking the type of crime maybe as an attribute. Okay, okay. so that might be one way to do it. You know, so look at the type of crime and say, can you predict it based on other features? You know, again, and that's fine. That would be okay if you can come up with a plausible story. And you said, and so the other way you were saying? Well, and the other way would just be the opposite. You, you know, based on what the crime is, you try to guess where it happened. Right. So it might be possible to construct a reasonable instance of clustering from an unlabeled data set. But I can't say for sure that it always would be. It depends on the context. So then I would expect that if you wish to do it that way, you would present it that way. You would actually say, look, I'm going to take this data set. I'm going to treat this as the feature, as a label. And I'm gonna, this is the interesting problem that now comes out of this. If you can do that, I'm happy with it. It's hard to do. But, but you have to, I mean, the, the point is you're going to end up clustering this thing, right? And so the goal is not to do mechanically, I mean, part of the goal is to be able to mechanically run a clustering algorithm and just have the software uh, chops to do it. But part of it is to generate something meaningful. Otherwise, it's, why, why are we doing this in the first place? So, so put in that effort, if you can, and if you make a plausible story, or I, you know, if you think it's plausible, put it on the page, we'll all look at it, right? it's not just me. So if you put it on the page with your argument, then others can also comment on this as well, and I would encourage that as well, to sort of say, well, you know, well, I don't think this is an interesting problem, or I think this is good, you know, whatever. Okay? All right. Okay. Any other questions about the first slide? 
so far. Yeah, so like I said, this is going to be the, the hardest part is going to be this first part, find the data. I suspect running it will be annoying when one's kind of, you know, it'll take you two hours and lots of coffee, but it won't be, it'll be annoying in a different way, whereas this is annoying in a much harder way because you really have to go search and it takes some time. So I hope you're spending that time now looking and, you know, uh, and looking for it. All right, good. Um, let me see now. So where did we stop? So, so last time we finished our discussion of the k center algorithm. And we remarked on this problem of, of sort of outlines, right? And this is again a lot of what we're doing right now. These first few lectures is not so much is is talking about particular clustering formulations, but is also revealing some of the more basic problems that are going to show up in every clustering problem, right? So we saw the problem with k, right? How do you choose k as a model selection problem? And this is going to come up over and over again. It's not just specific to k center. Uh, we saw this problem of how do you pick the cluster centers? What does it mean to pick a center in an arbitrary metric space? That's again going to come up over and over again. And now we're seeing this problem of outliers and of stability and of noise or whatever what you call it. And the basic problem being that because the k-center objective is saying for each cluster, the cost of a cluster, the measure of how good it is or how bad it is to be able to measure the cost, is this diameter notion or is the radius of this cluster center very sensitive to outliers. One point can really mess up the whole thing. And as you see, as you start playing the deck, you realize this is annoying because if I have a few noisy points, I don't want my clustering algorithm to get so distracted by those points, it just gives me a bad answer. Right? So on the one hand, it'll give me a meaningless answer because it'll try to really hard to fit these outliers. And on the other hand, because it is now saying that the best cost solution is very large because of this one outlier, it means that it can find any solution that's a large cost, which is going to be even worse. Right? You might argue that if I find a clustering that has all these points and this one extra point, that's not terrible. Maybe I can figure this out. What's worse is that the, somehow the cost of this cluster gives the algorithm permission in some sense to find even worse ones. Because we'll have to pay this cost anyway. Why should I put in the effort to find a good one? I mean, the algorithm's not thinking that, but it really is thinking that in terms of its optimization. So there are levels at which this is a bad thing in terms of not capturing the data and not capturing the cost curve. And so we talked a little bit about how to make this more robust. And thankfully, uh, statisticians have done all this work for us because they talked about this notion of robustness. The idea that you, know, you want some kind of function on your data that if you include some bit of noise to it, some element that is noisy, this thing does not change too much. Right? If you go to the Lipschitz condition, you can do it anywhere you want. But formally, you can say things like, if I take one data point and move it to infinity, or very far away from the rest, this estimator should not also move to infinity. Something that the mean, for example, does not satisfy. It goes off to infinity. So we observe that the median does satisfy this property, the median of n numbers. If I take n numbers and find the median, um, x1 to xn, just numbers, we know that this does not go off to infinity. You need to actually destroy half the points to make the median also get destroyed. In order to go to infinity. And that's good. And again, you can think of this as just saying, okay, all the points are aligned, right? All these numbers, and you basically find the thing in the middle. What's going on? Because the things go off in the side, change the middle. And then we said this is useless as a measure for anything more than one dimension because there's no notion of ordering, and this is very dependent on the idea of ordering. So we said, okay, we can reformulate this. This is equivalent to saying, find the the argument, the thing that minimizes, right, over all points, um, the sum of xi to p. And when I say equality, I mean when d is actually on the line. Right? And again, I argue that while this is counterintuitive, this number goes off to infinity, the actual position of the answer doesn't change very much. Because if one point moves on infinity, its cost increases, but it doesn't really change what the argument is. And this allowed us to then generalize this notion to arbitrary dimensions, and in fact, to a metric space. Because all I'm relying on here is a notion of a distance. I'm not relying on anything else. In fact, I'm not even relying on the fact that the metric. Okay. So then I'm saying, OK, I will now define the median, or the very ugly named medoid uh, that you might come across every now and then. This is like a, a bad neologism of centroid, but it sounds much worse. Uh, so a medoid, it's, it's a horrible word, I hate saying uh, is basically, you know, for a given, so given a set of points, in a cluster, let's say p1 through pk belong to a cluster. Um, I want to find the arg min. And again, we can talk about what this min is over. In this case, we'll just say it's min over all points in C. 
sigma d pi chroma. So in other words, I played this little sort of slate of hand on you, right? I said, okay, I like medians. I can redefine medians this way, and I'm gonna define the medium this way. <laughs> it's a standard trick, it's a functional version of this thing, right? So if you try to think of this as being the middle, it's not as well defined. If there's no middle as such, but instead it captures that basically. But things will be kind of more. So far so good. So now we have a notion of a of a way of a cost for a cluster that is hopefully more robust because of these properties. Okay. Now we'd like to use this to generate a clustering problem driven by this idea. What would that clustering problem look like? What is the clustering problem induced by this question, by this idea? And this is again how we'll often define clustering formulations. We'll come up with some idea of something that is good for a cluster, and we want to generate a problem model. How do you generate a problem model this idea? Even P1, P1, two PK are partitions, right? Uh, in this, uh, P1 it just, it just points to a single cluster. Oh. So yes, you can do, okay, let's say I have a partition of the input, right? That's the way you start off. So find a partition of the input that has something. Go ahead. This. Um, find a partition. I'm not sure I should manual go help you find it. That should have uh, where you minimize the distance of each point to this medioid that you have calculated. So, okay, a partition that minimizes the difference of all those points clustered around this medioid. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, Or? Well, I'm saying for a given cluster, yes. you have this you have this definition. I mean so now I'll say for a partition, which is a collection of clusters, what do I want? If uh, the same applied to the, all the but what specifically? Uh, R n of uh, one to two k distance between them, a point. Okay. Um, all right. Here on the right track, it's just uh, I'm, I'm trying to pull up. Yeah, Ram, you want to? No, I was thinking something else. I mean, okay. if these are the points belonging to the same cluster, yes. all P1, P K, and I mean this this uh, argument, this thing, this states like uh, the cluster should be compact. You know, that's the idea. So open, yeah. Yes, that's the idea. That's right. But then, how do you make that into a into a, into a formulation for a clustering problem? So you're trying to convert a vague intuition about what makes a cluster good into a definition about what makes a cluster ring good. That's what we're trying to go from this to that. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to do here. Similarly to how we said, okay, we want a cluster to be compact, we'll measure in terms of the diameter, and that allows <coughs> us to generate a clustering problem. <coughs> find a partition that has good clusters, mm -hmm. right? So we want to say find a partition that has good, good clusters, where good is now defined this way. So we're very close to an actual formal definition of a problem. But when, uh, the minimum distance between all the meteors has to be maximum. Why? Why do I care? I mean, I, I agree that it might be a good thing to have it, but is it necessary? I'm trying to layer off my assumptions one by one. Right now, I'm only working with this. So let me let me sort of propose what might be right. So the, the clustering problem would now be, and we'll call this the k-median problem. 
because I refuse to say we were again. Uh, this is actually the name of the problem. Is find a partition as usual, which we'll call you know pi is equal to c1 to ck, so that c that k clusters, right, of the input of x such that I minimize some measure of cost. Now we know the cost for a single cluster described this way. And we want to combine all these clauses, but since we're, you know, since we're adding ones, we'll keep adding them, because we will admit. So we want to minimize the sum right, over all clusters of the cost of CI, where the cost of CI is equal to the, um, the, the sum of the distances of the log of P on the ci, p comma mi, where mi is the medium. Okay, this is sort of written in a kind of backwards way. But what we're saying is that we believe that using this median definition to define the compactness of a cluster is a good way, is a more robust way of doing things, which automatically induces a, a partitioning problem that says, make sure all my clusters are good. When I say all of them, I mean in the summation sense. Again, not just max or min, because I don't want to deal with outliers, but in some kind of average sense. You can think of this like the average cost of a cluster. I could, I, could, I could just as well divide this by k. So the average cost of a cluster is good, where the cost of a cluster is the average distance again. And this is a bit more loose, because clusters are different sizes, but morally speaking, there's like an average cost in the center. So this formulation now, is an attempt to make the original formulation a bit more robust. But again, and it's still in a metric space, I don't need to know anything other than the fact that my data admits a metric. I don't have to have any other structural problem with this. And I can still define this more robust. So this is what I was trying to get at, right? This is how we go from this to that. And you could imagine, right, if I tomorrow I change this, I could change the problem again. For k center, it was merely min of max of cost of cluster i, where the cluster i cost was that. So pretty much all of these kind of partition-based clustering algorithms or problems look like this. They have some kind of cost per cluster, and they want to find a partition that best optimizes the overall cost per cluster. Okay, does that make sense? Yes? Okay, any questions about this? Before we move on to how to do this. Yes. Why just the sum? Like sum of the costs. Uh, there can be many other things, right? Like yes, just there could be. Yeah. And you could play all kinds of games with this. This is why we have 10,000 costing algorithms for every, 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 every minute we spend this cost. Yes, but, but in my view, and this is just my personal view, if we're going to be robust anyway by averaging, why stop there? Might as well average all the way through. Mm -hmm. When you get to k-means, it actually there's a more Ah, how do we do this? How do we solve this problem? I mean, it's all very well. Like I just said, it's all very well to define how do we solve it. I will take that in the board. Ten seconds, or if no one else has any more questions. 
Actually, how can you verify? Uh, how do you verify it's optimal? I mean, that's not true. This is an NPR problem. It's not an NPR problem. You can check that its cost is at least, at most, somewhat blah, blah, blah. But as far as the optimization goes, uh, if I, uh, to produce a solution that's actually optimal, is a bit close to optimal. Yeah, this is also NPR, by the way, in case you, not that any of you should be surprised at this point. <laughs> any other questions? Okay, so what do we do this now? So we had our case center problem, and we had the case center algorithm, which is quite simple. I also argued very hand wavily that it gives you this good approximation to the true optimal solution, which is nice. You know that it actually does something. What now? What should we do? Can you, in the next five minutes, come up with a solution? Because always, you know, the first thing would be to be lazy. Can we just apply our case center algorithm to this problem? After all, we're just trying to find centers, right? I mean, if you think of this as really about finding these centers, can we find the centers first, right? Okay, so, so the trick here with these kind of things is, so here's my, my claim down, right? I, I have no idea this is gonna work, but this would be how I think it would work. Right? So, step one, find centers. Find centers. Step two, um, assign points to centers. Three properties. Notice that, you remember this property I mentioned, uh, I think in the first lecture, it's called the Voronoi property, this nearest neighbor property? Yes. Okay. Is the nearest neighbor property true for this cost? In other words, is it true that it is always better under that overall cost function to assign a point to its nearest cluster state? So in other words, this is my objective. I come up with some centers which I claim are good. Is it always better to assign a point to its nearest cluster state? What do you think? Remember, I'm trying to minimize this overall objective. Okay. And this in turn is this double sum. It's really a double sum. Is the Borna property satisfied? I mean, the reason I'm asking is because I want to find centers first and assign cautious centers. I can't do this. Unless I know the Voronoi property, so it'll be a lot harder to If it is, it's easy. Every point just goes to its nearest neighbor. But if not, I have trouble. So I need to know this property works. Does it work? I think I think it should be. You think it should be? Yes. Which is good, but because <coughs> because if you have like clusters, the C1, C2, CK, they okay. are, these are fixed, then so you, consider, let me fix some cluster centers. you consider any point. So let's say I have three cluster centers here: C1, okay. C2, C2. So then, okay. so then you have now. I, hold on. Okay. I, I take a point. Now. So that point should be uh, should belong to C1. I mean, if you, if okay, you so let's say yeah. So let's okay. say in particular that C1 happens to be its nearest neighbor, mm -hmm. but let's say it's actually assigned to C2. No, distance will be more than in that case, and that it will be more. But so what? You are minimizing the distance over there. I mean, the cost and cost is basically the distance between the point and the cost is basically the sum of the distances. Yes. So moving this assignment from here to here mm -hmm. can only de can, can never increase this overall cost, right? Because I'm just adding up the distances. Making this decision for one point and one median doesn't change anything for anyone else if I do this. So it's always better to assign a point to its nearest neighbor because of, because of the way I'm combining distance. There'll be other cases where this not, does not hold that well. But for now, that's where it is. And therefore, I can actually do the second step. I can say, find me the centers and then you know, assign points to the nearest neighbor. This, in, in effect, was the algorithm we had for key center. For k center, what do we say? Take a point. Take its furthest neighbor. Take its furthest neighbor. Keep going. You have k of them. Declare them to be a cluster centers. When someone actually wants a partition, oh, just do nearest neighbor because we know the Voronoi property holds. I'm proposing doing the same thing here because I'm lazy. Why, why should I come up with a new algorithm when old one would work? But does it? Would it work? And I'm not asking necessarily for proof right now whether it does or doesn't. I want your, I want your intuition about this. What's your feeling? About this? So, 
audio. As you can see, I'm kind of annoying that I'm being close and thinking about it. Right? I know it's hard to think online, I agree, but, but these are things that it's important to think about. All of these steps are important. I just I don't want just a couple of people. This is a small enough class that if the worst comes to us, I might start taking it alone. And the, the point is not to sort of see if you know the answer. The point is just to get people talking. There is no right answer in these things. And I'm not looking for the right answer. We're just talking. So, but I want you to sort of express your confusion out loud. So that's a good thing to do. What, 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 you're asking again? what is the third? The, third? the question I'm asking is, can you give me some feeling as to whether this algorithm, find the centers first, that, that we have for Gonzalez, so for a case center, right? Just pick points for this point, pick, the, uh, pick a center, pick it's for this neighbor, pick it's for this neighbor, pick it's for this neighbor, and then assign points to the nearest plus center. Is it likely to work with this formulation? Because if it did, we'd be very happy. That's one algorithm, two problems, yes. The third point is profit. Profit. Profit, okay. we win. Mm -hmm. We kill two problems with one word. So just by assigning once, uh, you are done. That's what you're saying. That's my claim. I think I'm right. That's why I do so step two. My question is, do you think it's likely to work? I want your opinion. And, and, and the first first point in which you are calculating the center, you are picking up random D. Right? No. I mean, I mean, I'm going to run the case center. I'm going to run, take a point, take its furthest neighbor. Take, take you always said, okay, okay. okay. cluster center should be kind of far from each other. What's the point of them being too close? Okay. Then they're all saying the same thing. They need to be far. Don't then it is not it is not uh, confirmed that uh, it will work. No, I agree it's not confirmed. Yes. But are you saying that, that you don't think it will work? Or you think that uh, I don't know proof? I agree I don't know proof. But that doesn't mean I'm looking for a, a gut feeling. That's how we all operate. We sort of have gut feelings. Let me go try to prove. Yes. 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 What? My gut tells me that it'll work. Can you can you sort of you know? I take the entrails and sort of read them and tell them what they're saying. <laughs> I, I see what you're trying to say. Your point, I, I agree with your point, yes. It's a binary answer, but can you explain more? Um, we're trying to, yeah, like, like you said, we're trying to get clusters that are separated from each other. So Well, that's what the, no, that's what the case and the algorithm does. Yes. Right. And that was, it seems to be okay to do. I don't know what this is going to drive us into getting. I don't know if this formulation is going to force us into things that are far apart or not. The other one was, because we had a clear reason why it was doing it because they wanted to make sure the diameter was not too big. If you put two things far away in the same cluster, that cost goes up. But here I'm taking an average, yeah, maybe two points are far apart, everything's fine, you know, who cares? It's not at all clear, and maybe this is what I'm trying to get at, that, that the, the idea of taking things that are far apart is the right thing to do here. You will say? So, as soon as you ask I think the points per cluster, will the minutes for each cluster change? Ah, that's a good point, they would. So they want to do that. At that point, you're right. Once you assign the medians, might change. Well, the thing you put center is not center. It's not what. What, what is the obvious next thing to do? Recompute. Re and then what? Are you done? Assign what would happen? The medians would move, right? So what do you think would happen next? Assign the points. Uh, and then what do you do? Yeah. That goes on forever. Actually, what? But what you just done? What you just done is reinvent the key median. Which is actually due to not an actual paper on this. There was an actual paper called the k Meadows algorithm. We just said exactly what you're saying. Yes. So there is an algorithm for for, for uh, attempting to solve this problem. The problem, there are two issues that we're going to get to that when we talk about k means is that you know we don't know how long it's going to take. It could keep going on forever. And we don't know at the end, even if we stop, have we gotten anywhere interesting? It's one thing to make take a long meandering road trip and get nowhere interesting. That the journey is a pleasure and all that's all very good when you're taking the road trip and not in busting out so it actually stops on my interest. So there are two things you don't know about that. And so hold that thoughts. That was a very good point. The mediums will change. The thing I'm, um, I think that maybe, you know, this, uh, the point that John made, right, is that is a, is a good point that I, I don't actually fully understand what the centers here are going to look like. I actually don't. I could imagine they might be far apart, but there's no reason because the whole far apart thing only worked when I cared about the max. When I care about the average, you could drown the max in a bunch of small distances, and that might be fine. It turns out that this algorithm will actually not do very well. I don't have a concrete example, and I'd encourage you to think about it and if you come up with something interesting.
Our services are hard, but, uh, but I'd like to see one. You, that this is not going to work as such. And so there's been a lot of work on trying to come up with K-median solutions. I, I won't bore you with the details. There's lots and lots of very complicated methods. But there is one very simple algorithm, which is quite intuitive, much like the k center, but is very different. And is similar to K-medoids, and that's something you could come up with, but it's, it's, it's again, subtly different. And the algorithm looks something like this. As, all, as before, guess a set of centers just like we did before. Somehow, I don't know how, I don't care. Just find some cables, anything else. And now do the following operation. So now we have, so now remember that we have our metric space and we have points. Some of those points have been promoted to being centers. Right, so they're centers and they're just the rest of the points. So let's say the center set is, we'll call it S, just not to be confused with C. Okay. So now do the following swap operation. So, so let's say that we also define the cost of S as that quantity. So once you have a set of centers, you do the nearest neighbor calculation, you assign everything appropriately, and you compute the overall cost. So I'm assuming that given, if I have a set of centers, you compute the cost of the induced cluster, right, from the nearest neighbor solution. Okay. So now we're saying, okay, find some point belonging to the original set minus S, something that was not promoted, right? And some cluster that belongs to S, some cluster center that belongs to S, such that the cost of S minus C union P. So swapping out, you know, you demote one and promote the other, is less than. I put quotes, quotation marks here. I'll explain why. Okay. If you find such a pair, do it. And repeat. So it's again iterative in the sense of the other k medioids algorithm we just saw. But it's iterative in a slightly different way. This is what is often called a local search heuristic. What you're saying is that I have a current solution, and I greedily will try to change the solution. Not add to it, but change it by making a small local movement. Yeah, you go out, you come in. Okay? And now run this forever and forever. Now the same two questions that I had before apply here. I don't know when I'll stop, and I don't know that when I do stop, I'll stop somewhere interesting. So, yeah. so you said like you have to remove <coughs> one point from your current solution and then include another point from the rest. Yeah. Okay, so if so I can find one, yeah. if I can't find anyone, stop. So how, I'm done. How Declare how I'm done. You have to you have to find for that particular point which you want to. Yeah, so how would I exclude? This? So if you worry about the, if you forget about the cost here, the the correctness, how do I implement this algorithm? So I have a I guess that is arbitrarily. I don't care what they are. Can I implement this operation easily? Don't worry about you know scale and stuff, but can I implement this? Is it well defined? Is it hard to do this? What do I do? It can, be, it can be done, but it's very very exhaustive. You had a question? This is the thought. Would it help to add some kind of penalty, like some some delta or something to this? Where? To this cost that you are happy. I don't want it to be always less, but if it is just this much less. Yes, and I will explain that in just a second when I get to the quotation marks around the lesson. You're right. I tell you that's exactly a good thing to do. Uh, but <coughs> how do I do this? I mean, there's, there's, there's no mystery here. In fact, I just wrote it out. You have the set of k points, you have the n minus k points. For every point here, for every point there, check and see if the swap will cost you. Times n minus k pairs. For each, if you're really lazy, it might take you linear time to actually do the calculations. I don't care, just do it. Mm -hmm. And then do this. So implementing this should not be hard. It may be inefficient, but it's not hard to do. So I can actually run this. Is that, I hope you're all okay with that, because that's, that's the first step, right? Can we actually do this? Okay. So now the question is, again, the two questions. Does it stop or does it stop somewhere nice? Do they have ice cream? Um, in fact, yes, both things happen. Let me, let me do the second thing first. Because it's actually, and I, I won't prove it, but there are, because it's a little bit involved. Um, the basic result says something like this. Mm. That if you run this operation till it stops, and I'll have to define what stops means in a second, because it's tricky here. Then, this is the clue.
the solution produced. Let's call it S. Um, S. Let's call it S. Okay. Has the property that. Where S stars the opposite. Okay. This five is a bit of a magic number, but there's actually there's a reason where the five comes. So what this is saying is that, and, I, and I'm not going to prove this, but the, I'm going to assert that, and I'll give you references to the actual proof here, that the solution you produce if you run this algorithmic termination is within a factor of five of the best answer. Remember, for case center, I said the best answer we got, we got, we got was factor two. So this is worse. So it's a factor of five away. But you can still bound it, right? In other words, it's not horribly worse than the optimal solution. It's factor five. In my neck of the woods, it's counted as a good thing. In practice, it may not be, but it's at least as good as your bound. Okay? The proof is basically one of these characteristic local search arguments. You look at the optimal solution that you don't know, and you look at your solution. And you sort of try to reason about how the optimal solution compared to yours. If you've been in my class and looked at greedy algorithms, it's kind of how you do it. The optimal solution, look at yours. You look at what happens if you change yours to look more like opt, and you see that overall the price you pay with some careful accounting doesn't get to be more than that. And again, all this uses is basically triangular inequality. So all this works in the metric space. You don't need anything else. Okay. Uh, yes? Can you learn the case in the algorithm and then use those K points and then run the uh, You absolutely could. But there is no proof, as far as I know, that does any better. In practice, it might do a lot better, and that would be a good thing to do. And we'll talk about initializations in a bit. So it's a good point. You know, in, in asymptotics, you know, in the worst case, it, it doesn't matter. I, I can prove this bound no matter what you pick. But in practice, it might make a big difference what you pick. Right? And, and yes, that might be a good way to start. <coughs> initialization is a big deal for us. So, so whatever you do, it cannot go beyond five times. Uh, yes, this is the gap. And you could look at this now and ask a question about it. You know, could you do anything better? Is there something you could do which is even more clever here? And what do I think about this? Well, I said this was local search. I took one cluster and one point and swapped. Could I do better? For example, could I take two centers and two points and swap them? Any one of them individually may not be that great, but two might actually be good. I pay a price for doing so. The running time will go up. Because now the number of pairs of centers and pairs of points is much worse. Right? So I do pay a price for this, but can I get something better? So it turns out that subsequent way, which again I will not prove, is that now if you take if you take instead of one center, if you take P centers and swap them. And of course the right hand goes to the end of the P, which is completely terrible and all that stuff. In general, the bound you're gonna get. Which is actually very cool. Put P equal to 1, you get back 5. But you could actually show that you get better and better up to a hard limit of something like 3. Like if P goes to infinity, you still can't do better than 3. So there's a limit to which you can push this, but you can't push this all the way. And theoretically, this is a very beautiful result. Um, I think from the point of view of a, thinking about clustering, this algorithm is enough. But the fact that we can prove this is very, very important. And again, using these very simple local structures. The analysis is where all the work goes. Okay, so since I didn't prove them, I'm not going to expect, you know, I mean, again, I'll do the references. You can read them. It's quite a lot of fun. But uh, I want to move back to the point that um, you want to raise this, you know. So, you, so can you explain why you thought we should put something here? But it was just intuitive. But tell me, that's if, important. If you don't, if you don't set any kind of, you would be happy with this much uh, cost. Uh, if you don't, it can run much longer because you're small. You you think think even the smallest thing, it will keep. And you've probably all done this. You had some iterative algorithm, right? You keep running it. You have some threshold parameter you need to set, right? Otherwise, everything's going to get messed up because you know, this will just go on forever, forever until the limits of your position. You're exactly right. And in fact, the right way to say this is that. You should have significant improvement. And the formal way to say this is you need something like some parameter epsilon. So it should be strictly 
people at 99% of their cost, not 99.5%. And once you get below that point, you stop. This turns out to be very important because it, for exactly what you said, if you don't have this, you can't prove it terminates in finite time. It might go on forever. But with this, with this little twist here, you can show this will in fact terminate in a polynomial number of steps, and and the bound will so there's an epsilon term that sort of floats in here. Yeah. There's only a finite number of partitions, right? So if you decrease each iteration, even if it's by a small amount, you can eventually see them all. And this is true for this case. I think you need this proviso when your metric space becomes uh, infinite. In a finite metric space, you won't have this problem, right? Um, although in this case, um, would you ever? Right, you're always decreasing the cost. Yes, yes, yes. So in a finite setting, this will not be a problem. Eventually, you'll cover it. And so this argument that Braxton just made is also a very important argument that if you have a finite metric space and you are looking for a k partition or any size partition, right, there are only a finite number of such partitions. right? And then you can write down the number of cost for each of them. So you have all these partitions, a finite number of them, and you have the cost, and you just sort them now from worst to the best. And when you observe what this is doing, this will always move to a partition that has lower cost. It never moves to a partition that has higher cost. Right. Definition. So think of this long list, right? It's a finite length list, and you're going down. Eventually, you'll have to stop if there's a minimum compact set. So anyway, so, that, so, that, so, so that this is a very good argument, because it's often used as an argument to prove termination, that there's a finite number of possible answers, there's a cost function that's monotonically decreasing, and then the only problem is if you start cycling. If you remove this proviso, and I find something that's equal to it, then you end up in a cycle. Of course, that's kind of a weird boundary case, but I think that's a technical reason why, you know, you, even if it's a finite set, you don't have to worry about cycling. So you have this kind of strictly, strictly improvement. And again, again, the algorithms class, some of you may have seen this, and we talked about strict improvement in the greedy algorithms, and we talked about flows, we talked about a little bit. So, so yes, so A, we can get a good bound. B, by making sure we make some improvement every step, we guarantee termination of all number of steps, and we get the so that answers the k-median problem. So we can actually solve the k-median problem. And in fact, there are many variations of this. You can solve this if your data is large, and streaming, and this, and that you know of them. But the most important point is we now have both, we have two clustering algorithms in our arsenal now. We have one that works you know, in a metric space that has this objective of worst case bounds on diamond and gets you well-separated points, which is useful for many problems, any kind of quantization problem. And you also have this version, which is more robust, which hopefully is not as sensitive to noise the original. And again, this has to be tested, right? You can't really, I, I came up with a cost function that claims to do this, but it's also good to sort of, again, try it on examples and see what you can. So any questions before I move on? Okay. Yes? Are these constants in some sense optimal? The, uh, so the three is not tight, but there is some other constant that is. So these are not, um, you cannot approximate them arbitrarily. Yes, yeah, so for, for key median, there is, a, there is a fixed constant below which if you were able to approximate this function, you would solve the yes, basically the argument. So there's a hard one. But I don't, I'm not sure if three is that Three seems to be the bond that everyone keeps mentioning, but I, I have to check this. I'll, I'll post it. But these, yeah, these are all uh, 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 hard to uh, approximate up to, at least in general metric spaces, these are all hard to approximate to some constant. In fact, the key center is hard to approximate to within two, and you can get two. <laughs> so that's kind of a close case. When we get to Euclidean spaces in the game changes, because now things can be approximated arbitrarily. Is this the best Sorry? Is this the best we um, That's another good question. This is. This is definitely the simplest algorithm. There's some very fancy machinery involving LP duality and facility location and stuff like that that you might be able to shape. But I want to say this is the best, but again, I will get back. I'll post more about that. I'm sorry, I don't know exactly the point. If, it, if it's not the best, it's close. And the problem is some of these other methods, like I said, are just so, they might be better, but they're not very practical. Um, so in terms of an algorithm that's very easy to implement, this is one of the things. And that's, that's one, uh, one thing I'm going to you know, talk about this class more, and this is a, a contrast to other classes I've taught, is that I'm going to focus on things that are you know, more practical, more useful to implement, more things you can actually do. 
for all of these problems, people have gone come you know, no one except, uh, you know, a professor with grad students to dispose of would actually be connected. So, <laughs> so, so I, I don't want to. Fo I mean, there's a there's a time and a place to think about those methods. If really, I'm saying trying to understand the theory behind them. I don't think this class is that appropriate venue for that, and that's not what I'm advertising this week. So I don't want to. All right. We now have, you know, if we, if our data comes from a metric space, we now have at least two different tools for playing with it, and that's a good thing, right? Because again, our data does just come from a pure metric space. Or that may be all the information we have about the data. We can tell how far apart they are, but we don't know much else about them. And all this needs, in fact, is some kind of oracle. Right? I don't need anything. I don't know need to know features. I don't need to know anything. As long as I have some black box that, given two objects, spits out a number, I can run these algorithms. So that's quite something. But you need so little about the data to be able to run these things and get reasonable access. But of course, real data has more structure than that. And so we'd like to say, well, if we have more structure, what can we do with it? And can we do more? Can we come up with better formulations that capture more of what's going on? And so now we're going to move into a, a vector space. And in particular, you're going to look at the clean spaces, but we're really going to look at the use of vector properties. And so we're going to assume now that data is not just inhabiting a metric space, but the data inhabits a vector space, which means, like I said in the first lecture, and you can multiply things by a scale. And it's all about defined. Notice that there are places where it's not well defined to do so. As I said, if, you're, if your coordinates are that long, you know, you can't really add them in the way you think you should be able to add them because they're on a sphere, they're curved. If you're in some kind of more general non-Euclidean geometry, you can't add things and scale them in the same way. So this is still an assumption, but it's a very common assumption that you have some set of features and they're all independent, and you can add them and all makes sense. Okay. So as you might analyze in the vector space, and just for concreteness, we'll just assume each point is some is some uh, is belongs to some dimension d dimensional space. Okay. And now I have a bunch of these points that I want to cluster. So the first observation I can make is that now the notion of a center becomes a little bit more easy to work with. I know I've harped on a lot about robustness and why robustness is important, but at a very basic level, right, the average is meaningful. Right? For example, your points are drawn from a Gaussian, you take a sample mean, it's an unbiased estimator of the true population. So you know, we know we have a notion of a center, a very easy notion of a center, which is just the average of all the points. The, you know, or the size of the And um, given that we have some more structure, what we'd like to do is build a, now a clustering formulation, just like before, that maybe captures more of what we know about the data. Okay. And so we can take essentially the, the algorithm that we just talked about, the key amyloids algorithm and implement it here. So we can say something like, you know, um, so my algorithm says the one guess centers C1 through C okay. um, Assign each point to nearest Update centers to be means of all points assigned to it. Assigned together. Right, this is the KME Dwight's thing. And this, of course, as you probably all know, is the well known KME. This is also called Lloyd's algorithm. After the last person who went to most of the name of the last people who went to well as well. Okay. And of course, this is like the one, one of the most popular clustering algorithms. You, you could imagine starting an Indian clustering class with K. It's going to be hardly boring. So we're kind of, I'm, I'm going to do this backward, mainly because the way people think about this algorithm is somewhat backwards. In the sense of, I'm giving the algorithm first and not to talk about what it's trying to do. But it's such a standard algorithm you might imagine, and in fact it's it's a prototype for the way people design clustering algorithms that it's good to just write it down. So I have these centers, I assign each point on your center, I have the centers to be means, and I keep going. And again, I can have the same, I can have the same question when the stop. 
But I don't want to ask that. even ask the second question, how good is it? Because I have no idea what it's trying to do. So let's try to retrofit what it might be. So here's an interesting fact. Um, and I mentioned this very briefly, but I didn't harp on it. Um, we know that the median is the point that minimizes the sum of distances to, the, the, to, 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 this, to this point. What does the centroid do? Does anyone know the functional equivalent of a centroid? Centroid. The centroid is the point that minimizes yeah. what the, whatever that is. You know what it is? Anyway. Sure. But what does it minimize? Do you, have you heard this before? What, it, what the centroid actually minimizes? It minimizes something. It doesn't have to, but it does. If you think back to basic statistics, this is mean, the intuition comes from there. So the centroid right, is equal to the argument of this function. And I wrote it this funny way because I'm giving, I, I, and I sort of skipped ahead. I'm dealing with the uh, I'm dealing with the vector space. I'm dealing with the Euclidean distance. Mm -hmm. So the L2 distance between you know x and y is equal to the vector difference between them squared. Uh, well, you know, squared. This is the norm difference. That is basically sigma x i minus y i squared. So the centroid of a collection of points in a Euclidean space minimizes. The squared Euclidean distance of the points. Now, of course, I could remove this, and I would get back the median formulation, where the distance now was the Euclidean distance, which happens to be a metric. When I put the squared, this is no longer a metric, so it's not quite the same thing. Nevertheless, it has this property. In fact, I should say. There is a very large class of distances, including the Euclidean distance squared, that satisfies the property that the centroid is equal to the R min over all C sigma, let me call this D. There's a very large class of distance that satisfies this property. There are what are called Bregman divergences in the machine learning community. Um, I wasted a number of years of my life thinking about these So I thought I'd mention them. Um, but it's cool because that you use for your claim distances works for any of these distance functions, which includes things that are more information theoretic, things that are more statistical. It's kind of nice. A single algorithm work, works in whatever sense it works for all of these distance functions. So just an aside, I'm not going to say any more about this. But this formulation is more general than you think it is. It actually has much more things going on. And there's a big, very deep connection to statistics and estimators going on inside that. Which I can tell you what they So okay. D, the capital D can be any function or what? No, there's a special class. Okay. That has, they have a certain specific structure mm -hmm. to them. Again, I don't want to talk about this now, but I can talk okay. about this later if you're interested. Okay, so let's get back to this, right? So the centroid is the thing that minimizes this quantity. We have an algorithm that seems to do something. Can we define a, a clustering problem that this would appear to be solving? It is all very backwards, but it's kind of helpful to think about this. Way. And so here is what the formulation would look like. Just like the one we had before, you know, find <coughs> a partition C1 to CK such that now I want to minimize the sum over all cluster centers, right? The cost of a cluster, which will now be this quantity the sum over all x, j belong to c, i, capital C, i, small c. So compare this to this. What we're saying is that we've replaced this generic metric by a very specific thing here, the Euclidean distance squared. And that gives us the problem, which we'll call, confusingly, the k-means problem. Because you're basically trying to find k means. 
because we know that the representative of that cluster is going to be the median of that cluster. Okay. So tell that that's the clustering problem for which this is a candidate algorithm. It's an important uh, distinction to make. In the literature, again, you'll find people often confusing one thing with the other. They will be meaning to apply the k-means algorithm, but they're not actually applying it to the k-means problem. <laughs> and often, when you see things like this, a little red flag looks like, okay, do you know what you're really doing here? So it's important to keep these two things straight. This is the algorithm, which, you know, unfortunately has its name and sort of does things a certain way. It makes sense for this problem. If your problem is a problem that needs that kind of structure, that's what you want to minimize, then yes, this is the thing you should use. Now that we have this formulation right here, we can now start asking questions about how well this solution captures what this is doing. So the first thing you can ask is, does it stop? Does it ever stop? And again, by the same argument we saw earlier, you can show that every time you do this operation, assigning a point on your center and updating the centers, you will reduce this value. And so since there are a finite number of partitions to look at, eventually you'll get to the bottom. So it'll always stop. It'll stop somewhere. Again, you may not like where it stops, so it'll stop somewhere. Okay, because it's doing a local operation. In some sense, we may not be able to see the optimal solution, but if it gets into a valley, it'll, it'll stay at the bottom. So there'll be some local optimal rates. Notice that, again, the nearest neighbor property is preserved. Because I'm just adding. I'm adding the square of distance. But from the point of view of minimization, the square of a distance or any monotonic function of a distance is the same as the distance I use. So the square doesn't matter so much the fact that I'm adding them. And because I'm just adding them up, the same property holds, and the Voronoi property holds even for this case. The question then is, well, does this work? Does this give you a good guarantee? And of course, your first reaction should be to say, well, we already have the guarantee. Because we have it for this general case, and this is a special case of it. Is that true? Do I get a final approximation just by using this argument? Because this is using a generic distance model. Yeah. I'm just saying this is a special case of that. So you would say yes, which seems reasonable, right? Yeah. Sure. What do you think? What property of this of this distance function do I need to prove this one? I didn't prove it, but I say we need to, to prove that's fine. What property do we use? So I said we need just one property of that distance function. Triangle equality, because it's a metric. Is that true? Then? What is the distance function that we're going to be using here? We're using this. We're using dxy equal to the Euclidean distance between the two of them squared. This is not a metric. It does not satisfy triangle equality. If you try to do it, you won't get triangle. You cannot apply this analysis to that problem. This result does not work right. It worked if the squares. I got rid of it. Which I does back to the k-median formation. But the k-means problem does not have a solution. In fact, we know that if you run this algorithm for an arbitrary input, okay? without thinking about how they've chosen the inputs clusters, so you run it. Not only will it take forever to get somewhere, or rather take exponential time to get somewhere, it gets somewhere lousy. It gets you to a bad answer. It gets you to a bad answer and it takes exponential time to do it. So it's the worst of all possible worlds. This is the, this is the, this is, this is where I indulge myself with a moment of uh, Sort of whining about how this is what the 10 best algorithms data mining in the last 100 years. This is what we know about it, to be true. But there are some redeeming features that I'll tell you a But if you ask in the worst case what do you say with algorithm, it's really bad news. It takes forever to converge, exponential time. 
and it gives you a balance. Notice that you know exponential time does not contradict the fact that it will eventually converge because there are an exponential number of partitions. So this is not surprising. So what do we do? There are a couple of ways out of this problem, right? You and that's one line of research. So in fact, there are algorithms. The best you can do for this problem, the k-means problem in Euclidean space. You can get an algorithm that gives you, so you remember this fiber approximation I was telling you about? You can get an algorithm whose cost is less than equal to 1 plus epsilon times the optimal solution for any epsilon. So you can get arbitrarily close to the best solution. You can do this. In linear time. Even then. <coughs> but the running time, while linear in n is. Uh, so this is where you play a little. How many of you played Wackamole? You know the game Wackamole? Well, not many of you. So, so Wackamole is this little game where you put it on, put the battery on. And this guy holds it in a hammer. These little moles pop out. You kind of have to bang them. And the more you bang them, you know, the more points you get if you miss them and lose the game. So this area of research is a total whack-a-mole problem where your moles are basically n, the number of points, d, the dimensional space, k, the number of clusters, and epsilon, the error. Okay? And if you whack them, you've got them done to linear time, something nice. So all of these algorithms you can get here, I can list chapter and verse. You can whack one of them down, the other ones will become exponential. So in particular, this one that's linear time, the running time is basically exponential in, in 1 over epsilon and k. In fact, it's doubly exponential in k. So if you have more than three clusters, you just not use it at all. And I think it's poly and b. And if you, if you don't like that, you don't want it to be exponential in 1 over k, you whack that k down, and your d pops up and becomes exponential again. So you can play this game for it. And we, it's a good way to write papers. So, so, but, but, so you can do all this. So that's one line of attack, right? You try, to, you try to really optimize the cost, but then you pay the price in one of these parameters here, somewhere. Okay. And there are some meta reasons why you cannot do any better. Again, there's some lower bounds and really the thing that. But you, if you want to do any better, you'll, you'll be able to. Um, so yes? this, this means like if the epsilon is very big, then you are like linear time is the time uh, consumed is less, right? But the cost is not good then. Is it? Yes, that's right. And then other way around. That's right. So it's all the trade-off. So that's one line of attack. You know, you really want a formal guarantee, and you work very hard to come up with a formal guarantee, and you come up with different formal guarantees, depending on what you think is expensive. If you really want a cluster with five clusters, maybe you're okay with something exponential. If your data is living in 100 dimensions, you really want something small indeed. It really depends on the problem. And so the different solutions, man, they're all fairly complicated, but they're all different ones based on what you want. Another line of attack is to say, <coughs> assume something about the input. And it's not as bad an assumption as you might think. You might say, look, you know, yes, if my, if my data is all kind of clumped together, maybe I can't do it. But assume my data is kind of reasonably well clustered. And there are formal ways to say this. So let's assume that, you know, that the best clustering with k clusters is significantly better in cost than the best clustering of k minus 1 clusters. So this is a way of saying that your clusters are well separated. So for a, think of this way. Suppose I have a problem with the three true clusters, and they're kind of far apart from each other. Okay? And suppose I insist on trying to cluster this with two clusters. Then my cost would go up by a reasonable amount, because one of the two clusters would look like this, and would get pretty big, whether it's an average cost or total cost, or max cost, or whatever it is. So if you have a data set where there's a clear answer, right, where there's a big jump between the three cluster cost and the two cluster cost, where the k and the k minus one, let's assume that's true. And I know the k. Then, in fact, you can show that certain modifications to the k-means algorithm will give you the correct answer. And will give it to you. Easily. So there's one line of attack. In that and again, this is a little bit unsatisfying if you say, well, I don't really know if this assumption holds true, and there's no way to check. Right? But if you believe your data is well behaved, then this is an okay thing. And you can say, well, if my data is not well behaved, why am I clustering in the first place? I shouldn't be clustering. <laughs> a third line of attack, which is actually the most interesting, is a very simple tweak. It says, 
Just change what you do in the first step, where you initialize your data, and you can provably do better. Namely, what this paper, which is this is method called Genius Plus Plus, which you should all hear about. Firstly, secondly, it's like a very good outcome. Says the following: that again, intuitively. and pick the farthest. But that might be too extreme. That might be too hard of like, I want the furthest point. Like, maybe, I, maybe I don't want the furthest point. It's kind of furthest, but it doesn't be so far away. And so I do something more complicated. <coughs> I say that. I pick the, pick the first center arbitrarily. Pick the first center arbitrarily. Okay? So I have a center. And now I can write out all the other points in increasing order of distance. So what I do is the following. For each, so I have the first center, let's call it C1, and I have another point P. So I'm going to assign a weight, <coughs> the weight of P with respect to C1 is equal to the square of the distance from P. Okay? And I'm now going to sample points in inverse proportion to So points that are closer are more likely to get picked. But points that are further are more likely to get picked. But it's not as if the furthest point gets picked. How many of you follow the, the NBA? Mm -hmm. NBA and National Basketball? Possible. Anyone? No one follows Basketball? One? So, the, the, so, so you know, have you heard of the draft? The way they do the drafting? So in some leagues, they say, OK, the team with the worst record gets picked first. And then they start sort of tanking games late in the season so they could sort of get to be the first worst team to win. And the NBA at some point said, no, we're a lottery. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll rank the teams based on their records. And if you're worse, you have a higher probability to be picked, but it's not one. It's just a higher probability. Think of this as the NBA version of that thing. Right? So you, you want to pick points that are far away, but you don't want to do it deterministically. You want to have some chance of not picking the furthest point to allow for flux in your okay. So pick the next center. And you can generalize this to any cluster. If I have a cluster here, there's a distance of the point of the cluster, which is the minimum point. This you can generalize right here. So when you have to pick the next cluster, you pick a point with probability inversely proportional to W. You normalize appropriately. And then you pick your key centers now. And it turns out that one step, <coughs> that one step of doing this does two things. First of all, it guarantees that you converge in polynomial number steps. It guarantees that you will not take exponential time to run. So that's the first thing good thing. So the first thing good thing that happens is provable. <coughs> so this is all expected case because of, of, of the randomization. So what I'm really saying is that with high probability you will stop at polynomial time. And the second property, which is actually quite interesting, is that no matter what your input looks like, well separated or not, you can actually give a formal guarantee on how good the solution is. And the guarantee you can give is that again, the cost of the solution you get is less than equal to. Not great. Log in is much worse than five because as it increases, this number gets worse. But it's a guarantee. It's a better guarantee than you get if you didn't have this. Let's hear from, yes. Okay, so we pick our first center. We and you basically, keep doing this. we do the weights. And then you again, again, you pick all key centers. So the initial each starting subsequent point. center is only based on the, so center three is only, or choice for three is only based on two rather than two and one? No, two and one, that's what you have a set. Mm -hmm. You look at the set of centers you've picked so far. Okay. And you measure distance to the set. So it's just like the key center algorithm where you look at the distance to the set, but it's still okay. probabilistic. Yeah. Right. So you always look at the entire history of what you had before. And remember, you do this only once. This is the initialization step. You don't do this at every stage. You just start and you just run the whole back and forth, back and forth, center, 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 center. So it's just a one-shot procedure. Okay. And so the, this bound is log in, which again, if you're not used to this, is like, it's a number that grows <coughs> in, so it's not very nice. It's worse than a constant, but it's something. It's not terrible. And furthermore, if you assume that the points are well separated in the sense that I was describing earlier, then in fact, you get 
I want this one. And the reason I'm again talking about this method, again, I don't want to harp too much on the theoretical result, but this method is such a simple idea. And it's already become very, it's, you know, it's only about six years old, but it's already become almost a standard, you know, trick in the toolkit. That it's just very simple that will basically give you the same right now. Not, I mean, this is a little more expensive, but you do it once. But you get all these nice candidates, and you can guarantee good It is also known that one of the reasons why, so the, one of the big problems people have had with k-means is that it works great in practice, but the theory is around that says, no, no, it should not work great at all. And how to reconcile these two things, let people to think about all kinds of ways of analyzing this. And one thing we do know now is that, forget about this for a second, but just take your points, and you take each point and you randomly perturb it by a small Gaussian amount. So you put a Gaussian ball around it and you just move it by a little bit. And then you run the algorithm, the same algorithm before with arbitrary initialization. It turns out that average over the choice of your perturbation, this will not converge in polynomial time. So in other words, the examples that force the algorithm to take a long time are very brittle and very specific. You have to put points in very specific locations to break it. So in practice, it doesn't break because you just randomly perturb things, it's good. So another trick you can do with the data is just randomly perturb it by key bit, and then run it. And then it should be fine. This is called smooth analysis. It's been a very successful way to analyze linear programming and things like this, not a lot of things. So, so we have some evidence now as to why this works so well in practice. And that's why it's, you know, it's a good thing to understand. And these are the guarantees. And again, what this is doing is basically saying, the minute my data, this vector space structure, I can start doing more with data. Assuming that I'm working with this kind of distance function. If I'm not, I mean, I could have vector space data which is not Euclidean. I have some other cost function. Then I can't do this. But if I have Euclidean data, then I can do this kind of thing. Okay. And this is the game once. I'll run the report. Well, the, all, all these results are fairly new. I mean, so the first K means plus plus came out six years ago, or seven years ago. There's been improvements that make it work in parallel on a distributed system. You want a map reduced version of this because this could be expensive. You have to update these weights and then you add the new clustering, all these ways of doing it. And so these are you not know, relatively more recent than the original Keynes, which is much older. I mean, Lloyd's version of this goes back, I think, to the 50s. No, yes. OK, almost done um, for today. Any questions about this algorithm? So this is what I call, you know, at the risk of offending anyone, the Holy Trinity, the k center k and then k means, right? It's the most basic distance-based methods. If all you know is some kind of distance, you know, I don't like you, I don't like you a lot kind of portion. <laughs> Then this is what you can do with your question. It'll turn out that if you have more information, you know, that sometimes, you know, I like you and I hate you, then you can do more clustering with that. Or, you know, I, I like you but I like you less, which is different to saying I hate you but I hate you more. There's subtle differences here. And that, that also changes how you run your clustering. But we'll get to that. But this is the basic, the, sort of the foundation of this. Okay, so uh, this is in some sense today's lecture marks sort of an end point in the, the first phase of what you're talking about. So, um, so you, any questions about this or anything we saw? So I will put up notes for this. As you will see, we're now going to slowly get into the wild west of the loads of the lecture. This is why I'm looking much more for help from you all to sort of help handle things. We have, I have notes for this, and I'll put them up, and I have notes for Thursday. And after that, I'm just going to get it right in a second. Notes for the All right, I'll see you all in, uh, I'll see you all on Thursday.